Welcome to Vivid History, bring you vivid and fascinating historical stories through colorized photos. In the past, royal births were far from private affairs. Instead, they were extravagant events that attracted large crowds, with some even witnessing the actual birth. These births were bound by strict traditions and protocols, which didn't always prioritize the well-being of the mother and baby. While progress has been made over the years, with recent royal births taking place in hospitals, it wasn't until recently that this shift occurred. In centuries past, when a royal lady was known to be pregnant, plans were set in motion for the birth, including a royal procession to the birthing chamber. In 1500s, England, even if the expectant lady was in pain, procedures still had to be followed. The mother-to-be would attend a special mass and then hide away from the public eye in a process known as lying in. In centuries past, royal births were far from private affairs. Crowds would gather around the bed, not out of fascination, but to ensure that the baby presented as the heir to the throne was not swapped for a changeling. Marie Antoinette even had to give birth in public to dispel any doubts. Although public births eventually died out, the tradition of having witnesses present continued, with even the home secretary standing outside the room during Queen Elizabeth II's birth. A queen or princess who endured the hardships of pregnancy and childbirth could expect to be rewarded with a birth tray filled with gifts. These trays, often commissioned works of art, would feature intricate designs and may include biblical scenes or royal symbols. Alongside ornate jars of chicken broth and sweetmeats, the birth tray would serve as a reminder of the generosity bestowed upon the new mother. Interestingly, birth trays became popular not only among royalty but also among the nobility and even the minor aristocracy, although their appreciation seemed to fade quickly as a market for second-hand trays emerged. Throughout history, the birthing chamber was strictly off-limits to men, as every aspect of royal life in Europe was centered around males. The midwife, always a woman, took charge in the chamber, overseeing the entire process and ensuring the safe delivery of the baby. Midwives were even required to swear an oath, promising not to take anything from the room due to fears of witchcraft. However, in the mid-19th century, men started breaking the tradition, with Prince Albert being present at Queen Victoria's birth, marking the beginning of a new era where men were allowed to support their wives during childbirth. During the Middle Ages, pain relief during childbirth was considered unnatural and against the will of God, especially for royal women. In fact, a woman was once burned at the stake for daring to request pain relief during a difficult birth. Even when chloroform and ether became available in the 19th century, the pain of childbirth was still seen as something to be embraced until Queen Victoria revolutionized royal childbirth by embracing pain, relief herself, and praising its benefits. In centuries past, giving birth was not only painful but also potentially deadly for royal women. They would often marry young and have multiple children, with no real break in between. The risks were so high that they were advised to write a will and ask for God's protection. Unfortunately, even with the best medical attention of the time, many royal women died in the birthing chamber from infections or fever. Some notable examples include Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales, Maria Anna of Spain, and Maria Leopoldine of Austria. The birthing chamber, carefully prepared for the queen or princess, resembled the womb with its covered walls adorned with calming tapestries. Windows remained covered to keep out fresh air and natural light, as they were believed to be harmful. 
Superstitions dictated that everything closed be opened, from cupboard doors to knots and hairpins, to ensure that all energy flowed outward. Efforts were made to ensure the baby's gender by influencing the expectant mother's imagination. Queens and princesses were encouraged to think about having baby boys, with calming and male-dominated images surrounding them. Once the royal baby was born, the sex would be immediately announced and witnesses would confirm it, ensuring no secret replacements. The birth of the new prince or princess would then be publicly announced. During the 16th century, a drink called caudal was believed to prevent deaths during childbirth. This unpleasant concoction made from eggs, cream, porridge, and alcohol was seen as a way to keep a woman's strength up and help her cope with the pain of labor. It was also taken after the birth to restore a new mother's strength and guard against infections. After enduring the grueling process of childbirth, royal mothers throughout history were subjected to a period of cleansing before resuming their royal duties. This stage, lasting between four and six weeks, required the new mother to stay in bed and rest, while also praying regularly. During this time, the father would take on the woman's royal duties, until she was brought to church or the royal chapel to be blessed by a priest, marking her spiritual renewal and readiness to return to her responsibilities. Queen Victoria of England also experienced this tradition, although by her time it had become more of a symbolic tradition than a superstition.